Hello. Hello, everybody. Is everybody well today? I hope so. I forgot to turn down the volume on my iPad, so let me do that real fast. Come on. Oh, it's on the other one, too. Sorry, it was my iPhone. I'm trying to have a better sense of when people come in to say hi. You know, you know, Dave Friedman jumped in last week. I didn't even see him say hi, Dave, for like an hour. He was already gone. That happens. Anyway, you're not here for me yakking on. You're here for Ted Woodford. And uh, he's one of the, the guys, not just on YouTube, but people in the craft that that blurring of the lines between art and craft that I really respect his uh, his patience his uh, meth- me- uh, methodology his willingness to say wait stop there's probably a better way and then go for a think and come back and with something brilliant um, and a lot of times the the correct brilliant solution is far from the easiest and uh, I just find his his work. Uh, inspiring and enough gushing. I'm going to bring him on so you guys can meet him because he, he, like I did for a long time, was just kind of the voice in the hands. So let's let's get him out here in the limelight, so to speak, whatever amount of limelight this channel offers. Hey, Ted, it is really well, nice to meet you. Indeed, Lyle. Yes. Uh, good to meet you as well. Always a pleasure. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed watching your videos for the last few years, and everything you've just said about me, all those gushing accolades, I would say exactly the same about you. So well, we can feel equally embarrassed. The the other issue is that people always say how relaxing our voices are. So I, I think if we were both to mutually kind of slow down about 25 minutes in, the entire audience will be zonked out. And we can talk about whatever we want then. You know, uh, Star Wars, Aristotle, your choice. But we have to Indeed. keep it down and just kind of calm the hell out of everybody. A hey, speaking of which... ASMR. Yeah. Can everyone hear us relatively okay? Am I too much... Am I louder than Ted? Uh, should I come down on, on my level? I can't bring Ted's level up anymore. There's always that... 20, 30 second delay. Sounds good. Okay. Mm. Well, um, I think we should start with the most important thing. Uh, what string gauge do you use, sir? Because I know that's where all the tone is. Are we talking acoustic or electric or bazooki? Uh, ooh, I think bazooki. I think we should have a 20 minute discourse on uh, the vagaries of bazookis and see how many people stay with us. Well, for um, acoustic guitars, I like, uh, I like a a sort of a medium light string. Um, the Adario lights, which would be 12 to 53. Mm-hmm. I don't understand where they got 53 from, but uh, that's what I use on, I'm guessing 80% of the instruments I string. For electrics, mm-hmm. I go a little bit heavier. I go 11 to 49. That's Ooh. just a, I know. I've, I've, got, I've got 10 to 50 on my 335, and I'm, I'm boring 10 to 46 on all the other electrics. And I think I've, 11 to 52 or 12 to 52. I don't remember on all the, on the acoustics. I use uh, the, um, uh, what's the name of that string? Uh, so good. Uh, hand, hand wound, uh, uh, phosphor coated. Uh, someone will tell me what my, what my strings are. I always forget these things because they're coated. I order them twice a year and I forget. Um, Indeed. But uh, I, I use regular strings on my electrics because uh, they get dings, Kurt Mangan, but uh, the electrics get dings in them f- from bending and the intonation goes out long before I need to worry about coded versus not. So I just change those out all the time. Anyway, um, I, I, that was kind of a joke because that's the internet question. Um, w- here's the thing. When I get done playing all these amps all day with all the electric guitars and I've got some nice ones and very nice vintage amps on the channel. That's my day job. And when I clock out, I grab my Southern Jumbo. So mm-hmm. you spend all your day surrounded by instruments uh, from 40s Martins and Gibsons to $200 uh, dollar thrift store finds, parlor guitars from 1930 to stuff that was made 10 years ago to brand new stuff. You've got to get as fed up with the wonders of all that stuff as I do with electric stuff. What's your What's your... Uh, what aspect of music do you do for recreation? 
At this stage, my recreational music production is really, really minuscule. I find that I don't spend a whole lot of time playing for myself at this stage. And it's not because I hate guitars or anything. Um, it's just that at the end of the day, like you say, I'm kind of checked out. Um, mm -hmm. I get enough playing during the day that I don't feel the need to really expand on it beyond that. Uh, that might just be a consequence of you know spending a lot of time editing video and that kind of stuff oh, yeah. as well on top of the usual work week. So, uh, you know, if I'm playing a guitar, it's probably I have a couple of uh, an old harmony conversion I did, an X brace conversion, and I'll pick that up and strum for a bit. And I actually have a couple of ukuleles kicking around the house that if I feel like I need to make a sound, I'll pick up a uke and do that. But uh, not a whole lot of playing at this stage in the, the career. Yeah, sa same for me. I mean, I, I, I play to test apps and the videos, and occasionally I need to demonstrate what an app sounds like, and I'll play. Uh, one of the things I run into is uh, when I'm playing, I'm not trying to play a song because all the stuff I know how to play is typically copyright stuff from artists and you know i don't want to get uh, demonetized or strikes and all that fun stuff so um and i my, i'm so rusty because all i play is just to test uh plus hand damage over the years um i get so much criticism from the internet about man you don't even know how to play i don't see you getting that and and we're both doing kind of basic stuff just to show what the thing does and what a player can expect from it you you seem to get nicer people than I do. How do how can I get more nice people like you have? That's interesting that you would say that. Um, because there was a time when I was receiving a whole lot of that kind of criticism. It's like you pay like you play like a twelve year old. You have no business, you know. And um I don't know. You know, I the copyright strike thing is an issue. And yeah. I guess I've just come up with a, a series of chord changes that kind of work no matter what I'm playing and I just do that. And mm -hmm. um, I try not to stress too much over it, you know. There was a time, I think, four or five years ago when I tried to come up with recognizable tunes, but it, at some point it was like, no, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I think people just like to hear the sounds. So yeah, I mean, that's what I do. What I find is that pro players don't need to hear if I've got chops or not. They don't care. Uh, they, they know that they probably play better than most people on YouTube who do what we do. But that's not what they care about. They, they care about, hey, if I had that amp, if I had that, that that Martin, would it do the thing that I'm looking for? And if as long as I can demonstrate that. So I'm like, okay, here's playing really softly, digging in, a big bend, uh, double stops, uh, complex chords can hear all that. So I don't get... I, I don't get anyone shouting down at me from from the pro level. It's It's all people at my level or below shouting up at me because I'm not burning through eruption like a six-year-old. Mm -hmm. it, it's a weird thing. Um, here's the thing, and I think that you would be a perfect person to ask about this, and I'm going to shut up and let him to answer because I get accused of talking over people. We're in a weird thing, like an actor or a singer, where on the one hand, we are both presenting ourselves um, and putting our personality out there and to, de to a degree saying, look what good work I do. And at the other hand, uh, we are making ourselves emotionally uh, vulnerable. And, uh, you know, all those little digs add up and you can get very insecure from this. I, I know other guys in this trade who are like, man, I just don't want to deal with YouTube or Facebook comments or the gear page, et cetera. Um, how, how do you see what you're trying to do versus people's perceptions of what you're trying to do? I think that if you're going to be doing something like this, putting your profession out into a social media sphere, you've got to recognize that there is this kind of parasocial thing that goes on between the audience and the performer. And um, to be honest, we could have a whole discussion about comment sections in general. And I always recognize that if you have 50 or 60,000 views on a video, some certain percentage of those are going to be from people who have either no control over themselves and what they're saying or that they're um genuinely trolling you know looking yeah. for attention there's a little dopamine hit that happens when they can get someone who's on the other side of the camera to acknowledge uh the comment and I, at this stage i don't spend a whole lot of time looking at comments at all 
And yeah, it's, I've noticed. I, I've, I've, I've had some nice things too, and I don't, I don't think I don't think you get the positive either. I think you just uh, I don't need to see that. Yeah, and that that exactly. I admire I that. Think, I, yeah, I know. So, I think um, you, there's a certain point where you've had your fill of accolades, and you can only hear that boy, you do that so great, you know, so many times before you either it gives you a big head or you start to tune it out and not appreciate it. Um, oh yeah. But, the positivity you know, there, is just as bad the, for us. Exactly. Well, I think any kind of input when it comes to this sort of thing, you have to temper it, you know, um, having some idea about what it is you're trying to convey, you know, uh, I, I recognize that there are people who watch my videos who have absolutely nothing to do with guitars. They're not invested in, in the same way that other people are some certain level of geekery but there are people who do actually watch us because we're a relaxing presence uh, it's almost a therapeutic effect people who you know the first time someone tells you that you know i fall asleep listening to you all the time it's you know <laughs> that hits on two levels like number yeah. one is the content not interesting enough to keep you awake but on the other hand it's you know boy that's that's kind of a nice thing to hear that you can have that effect on someone you know helping them wind down from their day and um so like I say, in the comment section, I've there was a time when I took a lot of it to heart and then I quickly realized you don't need to do that because it's not actually gaining you anything. You're not it's not for your benefit, some of these comments. They're oh, not yeah. constructive well, criticism. Well you know. the overinflated compliments are just as bad for us as individuals. You know, if if if, if half the people tell us we're geniuses and half the people tell us we're morons, we got to we have to tune all those extremes out cuz you know we're just mm -hmm. us and you know i can't we neither of us can form our sense of self from others we've got to uh, be much more rugged individualist and, and actually stubborn old cusses i suspect in your case as well as mine yeah but um you know it it is a danger to take either side of it too seriously and especially mm -hmm. imagine the people in our day to day life if if we came in hey the internet said said i'm great or I can't play guitar, everyone hates me. I mean, neither one of them. I don't think people get a sense of how much work you put into your videos with the planning, the shots, uh, getting the focus and the lighting right for everything, doing the voiceover, editing it together, not just so you see the thing, but there's a narrative. There, neither of us are making films, but there is a narrative arc and there's a structure to it. And I, I see why you tend to do one video a week because that video has to be many, many more hours than people can relate to. I, I, can, I know what's mm -hmm. behind the scenes. Um, meanwhile, you, you are doing all the other jobs that don't get fo featured that week and dealing with intakes and paperwork and shipping issues and ordering. And that order is supposed to be here two days ago. It's somewhere in Toronto. It hasn't been uh, scanned through the next place yet. And you've got to call that guy and say, hey, I, I said probably ready next week. It's it, it's in the postal service. I have no control at this point. And all the guys, hey, is it ready yet? Or, hey, uh, what are you charged uh, to, to, to fix my guitar? Mm -hmm. What's wrong with it? Um, I like I liken it to um, I liken it to playing a giant game of Tetris. Sometimes the blocks mm -hmm. are falling down. And you've got to sort of fit them into a schedule that is ever shifting. And uh, sometimes everything aligns just perfectly and they all go bang, 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 bang. And other times you end up, you know, close to the ceiling, just sort of struggling for breath. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I try not to harp on about how much work it takes to put out a video. But, you know, the average video I make probably has somewhere around a th 100 shots or so. And it likely adds, I'm guessing, about 12 hours worth of work in a week to put one yeah. out. I try not to think about it too much because um, then you start doing math and you start figuring out what you're actually paying yourself for these things. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you get on a train and you just sort of keep going. And um, yeah. I enjoy it, obviously. I mean, I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't. So I gain a certain amount of satisfaction from making the videos. And, and they, I find that there's a kind of music to the, the whole thing, the production quality. Mm -hmm. um, I edit to a kind of musical beat for instance, and it, I compose them, you know, I take the shot and I figure out where things should land on a kind of uh, a, a score, as it were. And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate it when other people who do something similar can say, hey, wow, you did a lot of work on that. Because the average person isn't going to notice that. And they're, you know, in some ways we don't want them to. 
Like yeah. I don't want my videos to look belabored. Um, they're simple homespun. I never change them. Uh, at this stage, you know, I, I don't think people are coming looking for entirely new formats for me. Um, they're comforting that way. You know, you know what to expect. Well, you, you started, or at least when I discovered your channel about two years ago, you were already already at a much higher quality level. You know, um, everything was very clear. The audio was was more than sufficient for the purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. You could hear everything in the shop without anything clipping. If you turned on a, a jigsaw, or whatever, everything that you were demonstrating was in focus and well lit, and you could see everything. And your voiceover sounded great. And two years ago, I looked back at what I was doing just with a cell phone, and it's like, oh my god, I had no business putting that stuff out there for humans to be subjected to. So I've I've stepped it up, and it, it is a a slippery slope because now that I have the gear to get to this quality level, I want to say, but what if I did this? What if I did this? Mm -hmm. And then I have to feel like, well, I need to do it. I'd have to make a backing track for that. I'd have to, and then I'd be doing the videos full time and all the amps when I get done. So I think I'm pretty much, uh, minus getting a good B roll camera where I'm, I need to be for this, but just to be able to say, mm -hmm. Hey, this is what a scorched mark on a resistor looks like. People can see in, yeah, they can actually see the damn thing. It's that's this big in real life. Um, that's mm -hmm. been a huge change for me. Um, what, is, what is your rough work schedule like uh, during the week? Do you like film as you w go during the day and then you're like, hey, right, Wednesday night is my, I'm, I'm going to get all these things together, see where I'm at, what I need to do. And then uh, Saturday night is when I edit it and it goes live Sunday. Well, it's variable. It's kind of funny. We're just discussing, um, you know, clarity and everything. And I'm noticing how pixelated my uh, image is on the, the cam here, probably yeah. due to connectivity issues. Because uh, this week I've got uh, both of the houses on either side of mine, little inner city house, having undergoing major renovations. And, um, you know, the power went off. And I think they, they clipped my internet cable um, nice. yesterday. So I, I got, you know, I'm, I'm probably not running at full power, but um, I'm making videos with a jackhammer going off on one side and someone operating a reciprocating saw on the other, uh, you know, four feet away from my basement. So yeah. I get it done when I can. Uh, you know, I film, it's hard to describe, really. It's a free, free flowing process. And sometimes you, you know, just you have to get it done at a certain point and you, you put the camera on and you do it. I tend to edit late at night because it's quiet and my mind is at ease and uh, I find that I can really sink into it. Yeah, but more often than not, I'm sort of scrambling on a Friday or Saturday night to get it done and mm -hmm. uh, feed the algorithm as it were, because you want to be sort of um, regular in the kind of uh, the upload schedule, which I'm sure you've discovered at some point. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's like a coal engine you have to keep feeding it um otherwise you're like well where did my business go um it, it's it's good though because and i say this to everyone out there neither of us are big-headed about that but both of us know what we can do and what we have done and i worked very hard to get to this point where you can to an extent choose what projects you want to take on i i can decline one more blues junior and I can take in one more sixties Vox. Um, and it's an, it's a, we're beginning, I'm beginning. I think you have been seeing the, the fruits of all these efforts. I mean, that's why the YouTube channels are there to tell people, Hey, I do this thing and I do this thing very well. If you like how I do it, bring it to me. That has grown beyond my capacity to accept the work that people want. I imagine you're in the same situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't want to hammer down on the YouTube stuff because that's not everyone else's experience. But I'm just curious, because your videos have a start, a through line, sometimes you have uh, humorous themes that you, you know, uh, jokes that you, 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 you continue through the whole thing. Uh, especially, especially loved your, your Bernard Herzog. Um, maybe we'll get you to do that a little bit later. Do you script them or do you loosely script them? Do you have an outline of what you want to, to do? Uh, knowing that, hey, if the neck splits in two, then, you know, it's a whole different video than I was expecting to make. But, I mean, mm -hmm. how, how much um, organization goes into it versus just, hey, I've done this enough. I know if I do this, this, uh, this, I'm going to get to where I can make it work. I'll usually have an introductory script, uh, which will give me, 
a basic historical background on the instrument and just there's a certain amount of research that goes into that to make sure that I'm or hopefully not saying the wrong year or that kind of thing or outlining um, you know points of uh, contention or real trivia that you know someone is really going to call me on um, it would be a two-page sort of thing and beyond that when we get into the actual repair it's as it comes as it happens um, I was always pretty conscious about not trying to make an actual how-to video in my mind, they're like little mini documentaries, and that might be where the Herzog thing comes in, because I'm sort of bringing people along for the ride rather than trying to tell them how we do this particular operation. Uh, and hopefully something strange will happen, which offers, you know, a bit of interest, and um, it can be fun, yeah, we, you know. We definitely and, do and, and, have yeah, any control over these things. things. do go completely off the rules. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's definitely... Um, yeah, and, and getting back to what you were saying earlier, the idea that we've reached a stage where we can sort of pick and choose the work that comes in, there's really kind of a, a crisis of conscience that happens at that mm -hmm. point, because you start yeah. to wonder whether, am I a content creator or am I a fix-it person? You know, what am I going to do? Um, but at a certain point, the workload actually dictates that you have to start looking for things to provide interest on your channel, uh, because I'm sure you found that the the kind of interaction with other people wanting a piece of your time starts to, you know, take up more and more of your time. You know, I find there's a whole lot of correspondence that comes from my, you know, YouTube notoriety that, uh, you know, you've got to make allowances to pay yourself for that time somehow, because you're losing out on valuable working hours. So yeah. you do actually have to find things to work on that will be of interest. They can't always be a simple setup. There has to be something of you know real value for the viewer you know so they feel like they're getting something novel every once in a while what's what's weird to me is my perception of what i would want if i were watching my channel is not at all uh the case what most people who actually watch the channel seem to respond to as far as views and uh, watch durations and all that stuff i know that if i could put up a video tomorrow on a another blues junior blew up Five to ten thousand views. Uh, the fifth video on a on a sixty four Vox, where like, and now you get to hear what all my work sounds like, may max out at three thousand views. And to me, you know, um, I don't disparage the layer of V's you work on or layer of A's. Um, but when you have a, if you had a pre war Martin, that's the one that I want to see what was wrong with it, how you did it. I'm fascinated by it, by it, even if I could never afford that Martin even in the broken state. Mm -hmm. <coughs> in the amp side of things, people, pardon me, <coughs> tend to be much more interested in the things that they can afford or already have than in the aspirational stuff, which is a bit odd to me because in the rest of the culture, everything we're given is aspirational, aspirational. Um, mm -hmm. ha have you ever put a lot of work into a video that you found personally very interesting or engaging and then just crickets? Oh, sure. Yes, definitely. And there's really no predicting it, which is the infuriating part of the whole thing. Uh, I, I try not to think about that too much. I don't want it to let it color my perceptions about what I'm, I'm doing or anything. I'm not going to intentionally try to shy away from a project that I find interesting because it might not generate that many views. Because, you know, what's the point? There's, there has to be a certain level of self-satisfaction that goes into the video production. Right. You know, and, and it, they really are the sort of fetishistic objects of desire to some people. Uh, you know, people want to see really interesting old guitars that they can never get their hands on. And um, the question I get asked a lot is, do you feel do you feel a certain sense of fear when you're working on these guitars that are, say, you know, cultural icons? Mm -hmm. 1940s Martin guitar worth more than the average person's car. And oh, yeah. um you sort of have to temper your expectations and sort of say, at that point, you're not thinking about the fact that they're a cultural icon. They're just a system of parts that are broken somehow that you have to put back together, which is something that a lot of people don't really understand. There's a mindset when you're doing this kind of repair work that you don't see them as as valuable as they are. You know, they just have to be yep. uh, approachable. And I'm sure it's the same with, you know, an amp. Um you know, to it's me, a collection of parts. It's, it's a triode as a triode as a pentode as a pentode. They all work the same or mm -hmm. they don't work the same. Um, but 
That said, things in amplifiers are a lot less fragile than in guitars. Mm. I don't have to worry about, oh, I need to change the bridge and got so much tear out that what the hell am I going to do? Or now there's something there that even if I do the best touch-up paint, that's always going to be visible and that's on me. You've got a pressure on you mm -hmm. that I don't have because with steel is pretty damn forgiving um, to, a, to a large degree. I try not to gouge things or scratch things, but um, plus... I think the, there's a hu huge weight on you that I don't have because what I'm dealing with is the behind the scenes stuff that the average player never knows about, thinks about, wouldn't know what they're seeing if they look at it or interacts with it. Whereas you're talking about how the neck feels, how the fretboard feels, how the frets feel, mm -hmm. uh, the, the response, and just the, the weight, the, the, the resonance, the sound, and how it looks. And these are things that everyone sees. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, I'm not re reducing what you do, but it'd be like if all I had to worry about was whether the grill cloth was pretty, I actually I'd be out of out of work. I can't stretch that stuff for shit. But you know, uh, everything that you do is what the the owner sees and feels and 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 knows on some level. Hey, this string vibrates. This makes this wood vibrate, and then then I I, I sound cool. Mm -hmm. um, so there is extra pressure on you. Um, what I find inspiring is that you will have that high pressure situation where you're like okay i've got to reset the, the neck angle on this old martin um it's pre-74 doesn't have a truss rod i do i just do larger fret tangs that compress the neck out all right i did this has been reset in the past did they use a bolt that i don't know about did they use epoxy you have not just one nightmare scenario but you can have potentially five or six that you've got to deal with at once and at least on camera, none of that tension comes out. We don't think, oh my God, Ted's up against it. We don't think uh, Ted's nervous about this. We think, man, I'm so glad Ted's got this guitar. I can't wait to see how he solves this because I would have no clue how to do that. So is that the actual Ted or do you switch off the camera and say, holy shit, how am I going to make this thing work? Um, I'm going to go I'm gonna go fix that Squire bass for a while and not even touch this Martin until I have uh, inspiration from God. Well, no, I mean, there are definitely times when you have to sit back and see how you're feeling about a certain project before you get into that stuff. Uh, there's a mental outlook that you need to prepare yourself for. Um, it's funny, you're mentioning, you know, the, the, the level of pressure. And I've always thought of amp repair as kind of a very left-brained activity. You know, you've got components that are working or they're not working. Um, there's a very quantitative aspect to it. You're measuring things if you're biasing, um, where I think in the woodworking side of things, you have a much more qualitative sort of function happening where you're, you're looking at, you know, a, a collection of disparate elements that have to work together in different ways. And there are also different perceptions of what is the right thing for them to do. You know, people have different preferences, including action height or mm -hmm. the straightness of a neck or string gauge or all of these things. So... Um, yeah, I think there is a definite sort of schism that takes place where you are looking at the project at hand and also sort of foreseeing what could go wrong. Yeah. And that's one thing that I find very difficult to convey to people who call me up and ask, how do I fix something? It's like, well, I can give you the usual way it works, but you might encounter five or six things that deviate from the normal pathway. And I can't ascertain whether you have the sort of the knowledge or maybe the intuition to recognize when they're happening. Um, experience counts for a lot. And it's something oh, that yeah. you can't really teach, unfortunately. No, you gotta, you gotta make all the, all, the, all the mistakes, make all the mistakes so you never have to make those mistakes again. You just make new and exciting ones. Uh, I mm -hmm. think that this is a fairly rare opportunity, not just for my subscribers to ask you questions, but for a lot of your subscribers, because this is not something that I don't. I don't have not seen this on your channel a lot. If if you if you have done it, I have missed it. Uh, I think I'm going to open up to questions and give people an opportunity because you're being gracious enough to give us two hours. I'd rather have this 30 minutes just with me and then an hour and a half with everyone versus just an hour with everyone. And we're going to start with this super chat from Matt Fields, who's a, a, a very good uh, tech as well. He says, "Ted, as someone who's seen many vintage and newer custom shop guitars." How do they actually compare in general, anyways? 
that is so difficult to answer. Um, I think that things that are coming out of custom shops today are extremely impeccable in a lot of respects. Uh, depends on the custom shop, of course. Um, but there is something that happens with age that is completely undefinable. It's not something that you can put into numbers, but certain older guitars have, let's say, I don't want to say quality to them, like a benchmark of workmanship and sound that can be copied, but maybe not attained. I think there is something to the effect of having been played for 50 or 60 years, which, you know, it, you're getting to the weird kind of semantics about the situation, but um, if you ask me, would you rather play a vintage guitar or a new custom shop? It's 50-50, because it really depends on the guitar, you know? I don't know if there is a correlation between the two. Uh, not really quantifiable, anyway. You know, there are good guitars and there are bad guitars. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and there are good guitars that get better, too. Uh, mm -hmm. my, my Southern Jumbo is from 2000, and I can tell you for sure that it is a much better guitar now 23 years later after I have been vibrating the thing and it has been drying out et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I would put it up against a lot of the, the 50s J45s I've played, but it certainly wasn't there in 2000. It wasn't there in 2007. And that's a thing right. that a builder can't do unless you want to say, all right, I built it, you come back in 20 years and pick it up. It'll be fantastic. <laughs> but I got to play it every day for 20 years, so it won't be new anymore. Um, I'm trying to find um, uh, more questions. They will start flying now that I opened it up. Um, let's see, we had some uh, buffering apparently. Um, so far everyone's been saying nice things, but not too many questions. I, I saw one that I think I've missed. I gotta find it, sorry. I'm, I need, so, other channels that do this have someone feeding the, the, the talking head uh, questions. Here's one uh, from Magisterium. His name is Sergio. He's in Portugal. Ted, I binged watched your video since I discovered your channel and have been following. Will you ever show an electric build from, from scratch? The answer is maybe. And the thing is, I don't do very many build videos simply because taking that chunk of time to do it removes me from doing repairs. And um, I have a semi-repair slash build coming up on a Les Paul Jr. from the 50s, which is in a condition that, frankly, it should have been in the bin. Uh, practically speaking, it'll be a complete rebuild uh, and then some. I think it's interesting when you look at some guitars that are really, really damaged, the amount of time, effort, and technique that goes into repairing them is actually more strenuous on the person who's doing the work than actually building from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, I always encourage people who want to get into building guitars to at least try some repairs as well, because there's nothing that will stretch your ability like the problem solving you'll encounter when you're doing that kind of thing. So I may do an electric in the future. I find I don't have a whole lot of um, desire really to make a, a solid body at this point. I've done a few of them over the years and mm -hmm. uh, it's not really sort of the direction I feel myself drawn towards, you know? If I'm going to build something, it's probably going to be an acoustic instrument because that's mm -hmm. sort of where my heart lies. Yeah. Well, that's no offense to anyone out there who loves to make electrics and it, it, they're wonderful. I have them. I love them. But to me, if true luthery is an acoustic or a violin or a lute or a cello, or, you know, um, it's a lot harder to get right and a lot easier to get wrong. Uh, here's a question from Randy Steffs. He has an artist Hensel parlor size in very poor condition. Should I bother fixing it or just leave it a wall decoration? This is a really difficult question too, because uh, for some reason I'm now the world's expert on Hensel guitars. Hensel, for those who don't know, is a small Canadian maker who was around in the 30s and early 40s, building for essentially... Uh, you know, probably on the line of, of Kalamazoo or something like that. They're a catalog guitar. They were not great instruments to begin with. They're made with reasonably good materials. 
but because they're an early Canadian maker, they have a certain cachet. And um, the problem is almost all of them are in a condition that requires like $1,000 worth of work on an instrument that might be worth $800 or $900. So regardless of what the condition it's in, I wouldn't go into it expecting it to um, increase in value. So usually it would have to be something that you've played and loved. Uh, but there are enough challenges involved in restoring one that, eh, I don't know, it varies from guitar to guitar. If it's a, you know, a rather nice looking instrument cosmetically, maybe you go ahead and do it. But if it's in really rough shape, maybe you're better off investing that money in an, an instrument that doesn't require as much work to get into playable condition. This is a really difficult question because it yeah. happens all the time. You know, it's grandpa's guitar. There's a, a level of intimacy. You know, if we don't look after the guitar, we're somehow disrespecting grandpa. But grandpa bought the guitar for $2.50, you know, in 1939. Um, yeah. And he never changed you know, his strings. That's how much he thought about it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. John, John Burns asked both of us, but I'm going I'm to I'm let uh, Ted answer this because he only has X amount of time today. I'll, I'll, I'll get my answer to this later, John. What's the hardest repair you've ever undertaken? I don't know if I can answer that. Uh, I've certainly had some that were lengthy. Um, there have been some headstocks that were sheared off at right angles in a way that there was no overlapping wood that I had to basically build a structure into the headstock and the neck shaft to make them sit together, um, which are probably among the more technically difficult ones. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go with my average Gibson headstock repair is amongst the hardest, but I don't know if I can single out one particular instance. My, my, I'm sure, I hope that the, makes sense. The classic, it depends, but you know, I mean, it's hard to qualify hardest because there, this was difficult on one level, this was difficult on another level, and how do you compare them? Or they were uh, two years apart, so in my memory, they're both just, uh, they were both difficult challenges, but I don't remember, if I had them at the same time, then I could say, yeah, that one sucked harder. RJ Electric says, hey, Ted, I'm a big fan of your videos. Any tips on notching saddles on a tunomatic? Nut files and bigger gauge, gauges tend to drift for me. Well, you know, Gibson originally used to just take the set of strings and a small brass hammer and tap them directly on top of the saddle to initiate a notch, which is probably as good as any to get you a starting point. I have a small gauged um, razor saw, which is about 10 thousandths um, thick, and I'll give a couple strokes of that, and I find that gives me a place where I can sort of seat the file and um, a starting point, basically. Like if you go in with a nut slotting file and start to try to file into brass, um, you're yeah. bound to drift. So you definitely need a starting point. And like I said, knocking on the strings, realizing that you're going to have to throw those strings out and, and put a new set on before you're done is probably the best way to go about it. Rubber mallet, if you do that, by the way, guys. Rubber mallet. <laughs> Ted knows this. I'm not telling Ted, Jack, about how to do guitars. But if you just think, oh, I'll just put the string on hit with a hammer, the hammer matters. Steel claw uh, hammer should be twenty four ounces, a framing hammer, and you know put some. I, I want right it. over there. <laughs> yeah, and then you can change the bridge at the same time. Hal Vac or Vac asked, to "Do synthetic fingerboards hold frets as well as wood?" Hold frets. Uh, hard to say. I always glue them in. When I'm doing fret work, I always use fish glue. So there's um, a bit of a chemical enhancement. It's not just deal. I don't trust the um the holding ability of the tangs um in the wood the little barbs um i would say yes i've never had a problem with them coming out i enjoyed but, your you know, uh, that's me your your test video the other other week with the uh, roasted maple sub for ebony that was that was interesting mm -hmm. especially the fragility yikes uh, removing frets on a roasted maple neck would be, would scare me to death i'm glad there are guys like yeah, you who have to do it not me they tend to hold uh, frets just fine. It's just mm -hmm. during the process of removal, they're a lot more chippy. So, you know, that's maybe that's, that's why we have guys like you. Wire for. <laughs> yeah, I need to get some of my guitars redone in stainless. Maybe, maybe I'll send them to you in a few years because you, you, you love having people try to send you stuff from across the country. 
across the, well, the, the, the border, know, I, especially. Yeah, no, I've <laughs> I've had enough scary experiences with the border, yeah. including a guitar that went missing for four weeks. It just dropped off of the UPS charts, and they had no idea where it was. And I suspect it was probably stolen at a depot, brought home and realized that it was a custom-made instrument, you know, with my name on it, and they couldn't possibly fence it, so they brought it back to the depot and put it back on the line. So, you know, you just... Uh, it, it scares me. Trying to send a guitar for repair out of country is, you know, I, my customers in the U.S., I say, you know, you've probably got someone in your state who is as good or better than me, and you should probably do everything you can do to find someone local to fix your instrument rather than send it to Canada. Yeah, I, I, I will often say, all right, you're in Seattle and you want me to work on your app. Here are three guys within a two hour drive, I can recommend to you. Um, that may not, it's not necessarily gonna be the guy in the back of a guitar center, you know, uh, but you know, we're not the only people doing work at a certain level. We're not necessarily the best. Um, we do what is, I think we both do as good a job as we know how to do. And we, we care about it and we, and we show our work. So, you know, all our cards are on the table, but there are a lot of guys who do what we do, who just don't, care for that newfangled YouTube thing or can't be bothered. So we're not, we, I, I never present myself as the best amp tech in the world. All you need, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I think myself as a very good amp tech. Uh, I just happen to be one with a lot of cameras and, and funny lights. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I'm very much the same way. Tweezy says, Ted, Rosewood fingerboard has a white haze. He's thinking it's dry. What oil? I use, uh, proprietary lemon oil blends um the subject of fingerboard oil is a big one uh you could use like mineral oil or baby oil mm -hmm. um but if you go with the dunlop production that you can get at any guitar shop it'll be fine and that you know the the main thing is to use it sparingly you don't want to dredge the thing in oil and let it sit there for 10 minutes soaking up you know as much as it can handle just a little bit of oil on the board and then wipe it off you don't want, you know, big gobs of it on there for any length of time. So be more sparing with the oil than you think you need to be. I now have, uh, not that I do it at Ted's level, but I now have, uh, I don't even remember what it is, but it's some new uh, thing that Dunlop makes or whatever, and it's, it's fine for the, the guitars I have. But for years, I just used uh, non-virgin olive oil sparingly, and it seemed to do a good job. Uh, would you say that I've ruined my instruments? Uh, it, it, it doesn't go rancid. It's difficult. It can, though, if you use too much. That's the problem. The other thing is it can also soak into the end grain around fret slots and make it impossible to like, re-adhere frets that come loose. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is trying to get into specifics, but it's such a generalization. The other thing is never use it on a, a lacquered fender board. For instance, oh, no. there are people no. who try to put oil onto a lacquered surface. Not a great idea because it'll seep into any little cracks or fissures and you'll end up with a really blotchy, messy looking board, which is very difficult to repair. I mean, it'll always be that way. So olive oil is not my first choice. Um, I, you either want some kind of polymerizing oil, like a boiled linseed oil, a formulation of tongue oil, or you want a mineral oil, which is a non-drying oil uh, mm -hmm. that isn't going to build a film on the surface. I think I got the That's olive the thing oil with, thing with, from Earl Wine a long time ago. But I, I, I cut you off. I didn't mean to. No, no. it's um, I was just rambling. <laughs> <laughs> but it's my channel. I get to ramble. No, no. We're both used That's to being the, the only madman talking uh, in, 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 in the room at a time. Um, uh, let's see, trying to find the next questions. I, I think I got that from Dan Earlwine 20 years ago when there was less information out there about it necessarily. And he said, as long as it's just tiniest little bit, you know, like dip your pinky in it and then dot, 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 as many frets so you run out. And that was enough. And it doesn't go rancid. And I, I always have olive oil because I'm, I'm a cook. Um, <laughs> but uh, I have since stopped just in case I was doing doing things wrong let's see here you go from david uh, s let's see if i've missed anyone above david s's question i do apologize copy and paste it's hard to do 
eight things at once. Uh, Ted, is working on stainless steel frets really that much harder on tools? Um, yes and no. Um, it is more difficult to file, specifically recrowning. If you've got stainless frets that you have really flattened out after leveling them, recrowning takes an awful lot longer and your wrist will get a lot more sore because you're scrubbing away for a long time. But in terms of the cutting tools, nippers and that sort of things, I haven't really noticed a big difference. And I use the um, stainless from Stu Mac. Mm -hmm. um, it is, I, I feel like it's maybe 20% harder than a hard nickel silver fret. And, you know, there's, there's maybe 20, 25% more effort that goes into making them, you know, do what you want them to do. Uh, the main thing I notice about stainless frets is they're a little bit difficult to, if they're not radius correctly, they want to spring up in a way that nickel silver doesn't. So you have to be really accurate with the kind of radius that you're putting into the fret wire before you try to install them, because you're not going to be able to hammer down the ends and have them stay to the same um, degree of stickiness as um, a standard nickel fret. Okay. Bambuel asked about favorite and hardest repairs. You've already talked about hardest, but do you have a favorite repair that you've done so far? Something where you're like, yeah, I feel like I really have accomplished something unique with that. I think that's an ongoing thing. I think, you know, every month there's a favorite repair that supplants the previous one. And uh, I think when you're first starting out, there are some kind of benchmarks. Like the first time you do a neck reset, you know, that's a huge sigh of relief when you realize that you can actually reset a neck and do it to a high standard. Um, but no, I mean, I wouldn't, I try not to let them linger in my mind for too long because there's always another one down the pipe, right? That, yeah. you know, is going to require my brain. So uh, my favorite this month is, you know, different from the one that was last month. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud of most of the work I do and I'm satisfied with it. So I think that's the you know the the benchmark for anyone who's in this kind of craft is um, a th sense yeah, that th things are going I th right. I, th I think uh, those of you out there who've been in bands and, and recorded, do you really want to listen to that album you did three years ago? You no, know, you want to do the next album. Um, Perfect see analogy. Here. Yep. I've got a uh, super chat from Gal Elia Levi. I wanted to answer really fast, though I want the rest of the questions to be for Ted, not for me, because this is the Ted radio hour, and <laughs> so, so to speak, if I can do that without getting shut down, rather than just regular stuff. But he bought the PR-12. He wants a more linear volume response. That's uh, their version of a Princeton. Uh, that'll that From, from them, that's going to have an, a 10% audio taper pot. You can either put in um, a linear taper pot, which is going to be 50% taper, or you can find a J taper, which is a 25, 30% taper pot, one meg, replace the volume with that. And that's what the old Princeton's would have had. They would have had a, a J taper on the volume and on the treble, and that, that amp does not sound the same with an audio on the volume and a linear on the treble, or an audio on the treble. You want J taper for treble and volume in a Princeton, or any of the AB763 circuits. Sorry to uh, be so short with this. I do appreciate the super chat very much. I just want to have more time with Ted. And Surf Teach asks, have you ever learned a skill or technique by watching a video from another tech? Um, I'm sure I have, but I don't spend a whole lot of time watching techs on YouTube, which is something right. I've discussed with other people who do this sort of work is, by the time you're, you've finished filming your stuff, there's not that many hours left in the day to sit around and watch. I get a lot of people suggesting videos that I might enjoy, but when it comes down to it, you know, I watch maybe 15, 20 minutes of YouTube a day. And usually it's going to be something completely dif different from guitars because I'm at that point looking for a break from what I'm doing. Um, but no, I've watched, you know, I've been watching Dan Erlewine, um, Frank Ford, his technique for putting on a... Um, a clear plastic pick guard, which involves, you know, spraying a coat of water on the area underneath the self-adhesive guard and using a small, uh, like a pink pearl eraser as a squeegee because the water is non-compressible in the way that air is to get a much better adhesive uh, bond between the pick guard with no air bubbles. That was something that was kind of revolutionary to me. I need to see if that works on iPad screens. 
<laughs> I always have that one bubble. Yes. I can't get out. <laughs> yes. Another Submerge, reason why I leave this stuff the unit. to you guys. <laughs> well, just, you just rice afterwards. It'll be fine. Uh, Joris mm-hmm. Dirks asks, he leveled the frets on his Strat, and below the 12th, they are now about uh, 0.04 inch. Um, is he up for a refret, or is he okay? Um, depends on what the height on the other frets are. I would say that uh, 40 thousandths of an inch is pretty standard for most Strats as they come out of the factory, depending on the wire that they're using. If he's got, you know, 6,100 or, um, you know, jumbo size frets that are 55 thousandths as they begin, most people are going to find 40 thousandths just fine. And in fact, vintage fender wire uh, on strats from the 50s and into the 60s was approximately 39 thousandths to begin with. So, you know, it's, it's, does it feel okay to you is the main thing. I find that the shape of the fret top can also influence uh, that feeling a lot as well, how they're crowned. Um, If they're left just flat, they can be very kind of unpleasant um, to play on. But if they've got a more rounded kind of crown on them, usually you can get a a better playing experience out of a lower fret. Um, I would say, you know, you're fine down to 35 thousandths at least. So I, I would say just, you know, if it's working, why would you change? Top of your head, 50s uh, Gibson Les Paul Custom Fretless Wonder. What would that have been? Mm, somewhere between 25 and 30 thousandths. Okay. They are exceedingly if, low. If it, if it feels like that, you need, you need frets. Because, my God, how do people play those things? Or the bar frets. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, here's one. I'm going to, again, let Ted answer this. I'll answer amp questions in, later or, or in a different live stream. But... Um, uh, he says, when it comes to selecting someone to repair a vintage guitar or guitar in general, what would be some good questions to ask them to ensure they have the expertise? This is a difficult thing because there's a certain level of tact that's necessary because if you're approaching someone who has a good reputation and you're asking these questions, are you testing them or are you ascertaining whether they can do the work? It's, so, I mean... Uh, It's really difficult to suggest other than, you know, just ask the questions you want to ask and see what the responses are like. Uh, I, you know, if someone says, Hey, I've never worked on one of those before, but I'm willing to try. Are you okay with that? Or, you know, here are some other instruments or amps that I've worked on. Um, you know, you can ask for references. That's That's what I I suggest. uh, Always ask. That's the best thing to do is talk to people who've already had their guitar or in my case, amp worked on by, by someone, and are they happy with it? Had, did, did they have to come back f- five times before the problem went away? You know. Uh, that said, there are people out there who have been displeased with what I've done. Um, no matter what you do in this, someone, there are people who go into every transaction or every interaction with a person expecting to be wronged or wanting to come out on top, and therefore the other person has to lose. And when I meet those people, I increasingly have recognized them and say, no, 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 no. You, I'm, I'm busy for the next 18 years. You need to go talk to him, this guy or really don't like, and you're, you're going to get along swimmingly. <laughs> um, I really try not to pass those people along. I'll just say, hey, sorry, I don't think that we're going to get the kind of working relationship together that you need. You know, if, if I don't feel like I can satisfy you, then what's the point in us continuing with this? It's probably better for you not to, you know, keep trying to get me to work on your stuff, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, but I'm sorry. Come you're... into it. Yeah, and, uh, that's, that's, there are people who like me, and there are people who don't like me, and I have no control over that, and I cannot try to change to make everyone like me. And that took me a while to figure out because people would say things about my personality, and I would be like, "But I think I'm okay," and you know, and I eventually I'm like, "Well, sorry, <laughs> Mister, you want your free back." Uh, Fred yeah. uh, Fred Ricci asks a question here. Do, does mounting the pickups directly to the guitar body make a difference in tone? Maybe. This When we're talking about tone, um, everything affects the tone. The type of screw used, the type of string used. Um, does a pickup that's you know, screwed directly to the body, does it have longer sustain? Is it more full-bodied? Um, these are things that are quantifiable only on like micro levels. Um, 
and psychoacoustics comes into it as well. So if you feel that it's going to produce a better tone, it probably will. And I'm not saying that to be glib. Um, there are people no, it's, who it's very real. things. It's very it real. Is, you know. And there are people who ascribe magical properties to a certain kind of pickup, which might be completely identical to another kind of pickup. How can we say yes or no? You know, I can't tell what you're hearing. I think um, there's an audiology part of it, too. Um, I think we're dealing now a good portion of my clientele is now sort of in their 60s. And these are people who've been playing at high volume for 45 years, may have lost a certain amount of their mid range or upper frequencies. They're just not there. So they're not hearing the same things that I'm hearing, which is, you know, that's a real thing. So oftentimes you're sort of like, do you like the sound of this pickup? Do you like this one better? It's almost like going to an optometrist and having them flip the little lenses over your eyes to see, you know, which is working better for that person. Uh, it's a trial and error thing. Um, in general, I like pickups that are attached to the body. I really like, I like juniors with dog ears and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, here's, here's, here's plastic attached to plastic, loosely screwed to, to wood. And uh, if you read a lot of guitar forms, you should be able to tell whether I used springs or rubber tubing. You know, mm -hmm. does anyone want to bet me a thousand dollars on that from hearing it? Meanwhile, uh, when people hear this in video in, in videos, they're like, "What pickups are those? Those sound fantastic!" And then I tell them they're Kenman noiseless. They don't want them. They want to qualify it. They, noiseless pickups cannot possibly sound that good. Uh, now, granted, mm -hmm. they're not lace sensors or the stuff that Fender makes now, but you know they're they're really nice that I've put up against mm -hmm. Lawlers and Freelands and all that. But people have a perception, and then when the reality does not match that, like, but that sounds so good. Well, yeah, it does, and I don't have to worry about sixty cycle hum, uh, which I like. Uh, let's see some more questions. Siggy asks, "What? How important is the type of lacquer for acoustic guitar tone? Can the poly lacquered once become?" ones i guess become greater with age as well again there are so many variables in this chain um depends on the thickness of the poly finish uh depends on the working properties of it they can be formulated to be softer or harder uh, there are certain well-esteemed classical guitar makers who've been using um, polyurethane finish since the 60s, applying it in extremely sparing amounts and getting really responsive, excellent guitars that are used by um, classical guitarists on the world stage. So that would seem to suggest that, yes, if used properly, it's fine. On the other hand, you know, sometimes I'll get a Takamini in that's got, you know, 20 thousandths worth of UV cured lacquer on it. Um, it seems excessive and it might actually act as a dampening effect on the, the soundboard. So like with so many of these things, um, maybe, sometimes. I would say <laughs> you want a thinner finish in general, and you want a firmer, harder finish. Um, this is why nitrocellulose lacquer has been sort of the gold standard for acoustic guitar finishes for a long time, because it, it, it functions in a predictable <coughs> way over a long period of time. You know, we know how it breaks down. It's actually terrible in some structural senses, but it's the sound that we're used to hearing. So, you know, who's to say you might think shellac, French polish might be a better sounding instrument or maybe more initially loud than something that's got a whole lot of lacquer on it. But again, it depends on the maker, depends on the system that was designed around, you know, that guitar. I don't know if I can, well, that's a really unsatisfying answer, but unfortunately that's a lot of these answers are going to be unsatisfying. Yeah. There's no, yes, this is how you do it. I, I wish there was. It would be great. We, we could have retired by now. Here's a question from Jesse Hicks. And after this question, we're going to take the first intermission. Actually, today's just going to be the two hours. So this is going to be the one intermission and then a, 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 one more hour of questions with Ted because uh, it's my mom's birthday and I made a cake and I've got to go do a bunch of stuff and Christmas stuff is intruding. So happy holidays, happy Hanukkah to everyone who, who observes. Um, I don't think happy Hanukkah is really that great a thing to say. Um, and, you know, with I have such love for everyone. I always think it's, it's funny to say to myself, Chappy Chanukah, just because 
Why the Che not? Uh, anyway, uh, I just lost a whole bunch of viewers. I hope you all love me as much as I love you. Here's the question from You're Jesse. Living dangerously, man. Yeah. Well, my 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 beloved father-in-law is, is observant, and uh, he thinks it's funny. So. <laughs> Uh, does Ted have any thoughts on Martin's pre-shaped triangular X brace? Is it notably weaker? I haven't encountered one that's broken yet. Uh, I think that the quality and the orientation of the wood that goes into it, they're going to be pretty careful about the quality of spruce they use, and they're going to make sure that it has been cut so that there's not a whole lot of run out. So I would not foresee any danger of it breaking. Um, you know, Again, it also depends on the kind of top that that's being affixed to, right? Uh, you can end up with a really floppy top with a really over-braced, you know, thick piece of wood on it that seemingly wouldn't be the right thing, but they work in conjunction with each other in a satisfying way. So, yeah, you know, the, the X-Brace started off pretty triangular way back in the 1900s, 1910s, and um, gradually got more and more blunt, and now we're sort of going backwards in that direction as people are starting to use lighter gauge strings and um, you know, understanding that they have to be more careful about what they're doing to the instrument. So I've been, okay. I've, I've found them pleasant, you know, I've, the ones that I've played have been quite nice, so. That's good to know. Let's do that seven minute intermission and we'll come back with as many more questions as we can fit into the next hour with our guest, Ted Woodford. So talk to you all in a very short while.
the sir. We do what we can. All right, let's go back to this fun interview. Oh, I hit the wrong interview window. Sorry. Uh, I'm I'm learning as I go on the fly. All right. Uh, let's see. Next question for Mr. Ted from Peter H. He has 11 from 1915 whose frets, higher frets, are much higher than the lower ones. The guitar is buzzing near the 12th fret. Swapping the frets could solve the buzzing. Is this a bad idea? I don't think it's a bad idea. I think um, you do what you do. Having a buzzing instrument is not a good situation, so it may just require um, some dressing around the 12th fret, which is not uncommon. Oftentimes there's a bit of a hump that develops there over time. And if you've got extra height on those top frets, then there's no sense in refretting the entire board if simply dressing those down is going to fix the problem. So okay. I'd say go for it. Next question from Paul Watson. He's a regular here. Any advice on using reclaimed wood for guitar builds? He just finished a wonderful guitar using 100-year-old Douglas fir stairs he had to pull out of his flooded basement. The Staircaster. <laughs> Excellent. Douglas fir is an underrated tone wood. Uh, people associate it with you know the building industry especially in the west coast but it's it's a fantastic wood for use um i'm all, i'm a real proponent for you know wood that you find along the side of the road uh or salvage wood the main thing is of course that it's been seasoned properly you don't want to be using something that's too wet um you don't want to be using something that came out of a cow stall either because the 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 scent kind of lingers once you start planing it. But um, <laughs> in general, no, I think, you know, use the wood. It's a natural resource, and this is a, a wonderful way of making use of something that might otherwise be put in a landfill. So, yeah, go for it. I'm all for that. All right, David S., I am intentionally skipping your question about the popularity of nitro finished electrics. I think Ted already touched on nitro. Uh, right before the break, but Andy uh, Talamantes says, "Big fans of big fan of you both. Thank you, Andy. Any tips for an early '60s Gretsch sixty-one eighteen neck reset? He's working on one right now. Well, the main thing you're probably going to have to deal with uh, a lot of those early '60s Gretches have notoriously volatile binding on them. At this point, many of them have just turned to cheese. So you're going to be heating up that area." with binding that may also, especially in the way those ones are bound, um, is probably not going to love being heated up. So this might be the time, the opportune moment to go ahead and change the binding if it's really deteriorated while it's off the guitar. Um, but other than that, it's it should be fairly straightforward. You know, um, it is what it is. Um, the Gretches tend to be a little bit funky in terms of their assembly, but... Uh, you know, you're dealing with, you know, the usual set of reset issues. So if hopefully you've done uh, similar things with other guitars before you go ahead and do it on a 60s Gretsch, you know. When, when I amazing. see an, an, a, a 60s or 50s Gretsch that has its binding, I say, when was it refinished? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I see the ones in original condition and they're just big chunks and strips just missing it just it disappears into the ether i think i think it's like the dryer it, it socks. depends though it's it's infuriating because some of them it doesn't happen to and you don't know why because i've got a 64 61 15 in right now that is in immaculate condition and i don't know whether it was because it was kept in the case or maybe it was not kept in the case you know the the nitrocellulose binding that they used who knows it's a strange strange substance uh, let's see here. Tim Connors says he heard guitar repairs, neck or body, not electronics, uh, after repair are stronger than pre-repair. Is there truth to that? He always feels it's weaker after and more susceptible to another break. Depends on the techniques used in, in gluing them back together. Um, the idea that, again, it's hard to speak in generalities. Oftentimes, if you drop a, a guitar that has broken once, it'll break again. Oftentimes it's not on the original line of fracture. It'll be maybe a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch away from that glued area. The glue often holds, but because it's structurally weak in that point, it you know the force is transferred to an area adjacent to it that's gonna break anyway. So the main situation I mean the, the main solution is not to drop the guitar or break it, you know? <laughs> you just have to be careful with it. 
Scott Green asked, have you noticed an improvement or a decline in craftsmanship in established guitar manufacturers through, through the years? I think it's um, it's a series of, up, of ups and downs. You know, I think historically they're dealing with market forces. You know, Martin, we think of having a, a golden age in the 30s and 40s and 50s and then the decline in quality over the 60s and 70s. But, um, you know, they're building stuff as good now as they ever had in the, in the past from a technical standpoint. I think a lot of it has to do with the materials used. Um, if you look at the quality of wood that's on the market these days versus what was available in the 50s and 60s, it's going to have a definite effect on the quality of the instrument's voice. But in terms of manufacturing accuracy, um, with, CNT's, with CNC technology, you know, they're very, very similar to each other at this stage. You, know, you don't end up with the same kind of variability that you did in a, a line of one particular build that you did way back when in the 50s or 60s when you had individuals carving necks by hand, for instance. Mm -hmm. By the way, Ted, I want to apologize if it seems to you I'm not paying attention to you because I'm looking at the feed that scrolls and trying to find questions. And then if I look here, it looks to you like I'm looking at you. To me, I'm looking at myself. So I find myself looking at, your, at you on the screen. So I'm not looking. When I'm looking at you, I'm not making eye contact. When I'm making eye contact, I'm looking at myself. It's, it's an odd thing because just the way this is set up, I can't put the camera straight ahead of me. I apologize uh, if, I, if you see me looking to the side the whole time. I'm not actually that shifty but I don't want to make you feel disrespected. It's just an oddity of the setup no, no. here. No, no, I think this is, um, this is a consequence of our digital age. The camera is never where we want it to be, so I think well, I won't if be I put the, If I put the camera up there, then it's, it's all looking down on me and I feel very small. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think from things that you have said and, you, and in your Werner Herzog, that you are aware of film and um, looking down on someone makes them have no power, and I want to have a little bit of power here. So it's it's an odd thing Do to be Dutch aware angle. of all these things. Oh, you're so cool. There we I go. can turn off my lighting. Artie. So here, I'll go a Dutch angle too. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, uh, Travis McCartney asks, what is the best way to maintain a custom shop guitar with a relic neck that has the finish removed from the back? Should I use some oil on it every so often? I would say that the oil that your hand emits is enough. You probably won't need to oil it with anything else other than, you know, your own sweat and your own, you know, sebum. Um, not necessary. That would have been my you answer to too, and I'm glad to know that I was right. <laughs> I, I, I don't do this anywhere at Ted's level, but I've been working on guitars an awful long time. Not professionally, but systematically and uh, emphatically, I, I, I enjoy doing it. So it's nice to know that my suspicion was correct. Um, uh, similar question from Producer Man. Uh, he's got a 335 studio uh, with a torrified maple fingerboard. Does this need to be oiled, the board? Uh, yes, if it starts to appear dry, you can apply a little oil to it. Um, the main thing is, of course, is trying to keep your ambient humidity levels that the guitar is living in reasonable, right? Uh, living in Canada, we've got forced air heating. Uh, this time of year, the indoor humidity levels can be down in the 30s and sometimes even in the 20s. So, uh, you know, a little oil every once in a while is not going to hurt the guitar. Uh, but again, it's sparingly is the main thing. Um, if you've got drops of oil appearing on the surface 10 minutes after you oiled it, you've probably put too much oil on. So... Bambule says, Ted, what's the best budget guitar you've encountered? I don't know. It depends on the era. Um, Les Paul uh, Jr.? It's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, okay, yeah. Les Paul Jr. from 1958 was pretty good. Yeah, I'd buy another. But um, the stuff that's being produced now, some of the Chinese imports for $200 are because of the CNC quality, as nice a guitar as you could get in the 1970s for what would equivalently be three or four times the price. The stuff that's being made now for the budget market is wildly, really good. Um, 
So again, it depends on what your, your definition of budget is and the era that you're talking about. Because, you know, a 1937 Kalamazoo Gibson made instrument is also pretty good, but it's going to cost you three grand, four grand sometimes. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, Matthew Ridgway, I'm going <laughs> to skip your question for, to Ted about cameras because uh, uh, I want to get more of the guitar stuff that everyone can relate to. And I hope you understand that. Uh, I'd love to talk to you about cameras and stuff, Matthew. Uh, that's my one of my passions, but it's not a passion that directly applies to everyone, so I try to keep it to a minimum. Uh, let's see. Matthew, I'm sorry, M Michael Murray asked, Ted, is Indian laurel a good fingerboard wood, or is it just a, a weed that the Asian manufacturers use to cut costs? Laurels are very hard wood. I mean, as a species, there's no problem with them. Um, they might be slightly more apt to move seasonally, um, a little bit more contraction and expansion. But other than that, you know, it's fine. As long as a finger a wood is hard, you know, it, it can be used for a fingerboard, dimensionally stable. It would be nice if it was quarter cut. Um, but yeah, no, no problem. I think there are a lot of alternative woods that um, at this point haven't been experimented with enough to get a definitive answer, but generally speaking, almost anything can be used to make a guitar. Uh, a lot of it has to do with preconceived notions of what a, a, a guitar should look like. So if it doesn't look like rosewood, it might not be good. A lot of us tend to hear with our eyes as much as our ears, so um, I would have no problem building a guitar with Indian laurel. It's fine. Okay. Well, uh, Sergio, I'm going to skip your question on shielded cables and guitars because I can answer that another time. I'm trying to get stuff that, that Ted can answer that I certainly cannot. Um, JDS asks, as a Canadian, I'm wondering, it, what are your thoughts on Godin Seagull guitars as a player and a repairman? And how would you rank them compared to other companies? I have a soft spot for Seagull and its predecessors. My first instrument was a, a Lee. Uh, like Fleur de Lis, which was um, in the Norman family of guitars built by Robert Godin. Um, for that, they've always had a really high standard of um, workmanship using really budget materials. And, uh, you know, I, I like them. I've always been around them. They produced a lot of seed topped instruments in the 90s, which were fabulous. I would say that more recently, they started putting on their dovetail necks with epoxy which as a repairman I think is egregious, but in terms of the actual sound and, you know, ability, they're, they're fantastic. Um, going back to what's your favorite budget guitar, it would be a Godin built Seagull guitar from the 1990s, which were available for $300, $400. And uh, frankly, they're fantastic. For a domestically produced instrument, it's amazing what a bargain they were. If I if I wanted a twelve string acoustic without spending for the you know the Open guild of my there. dreams, I'd I go for a Seagull twelve string today, uh, especially one of those from back then, because uh, there's not a dang thing mm -hmm. wrong with them. Uh, are they aspirational? No, but they're extraordinarily functional. And if you're okay with the, to me, not aesthetically pleasing headstock, though it makes sense from a string perspective, they're really good. Um, a lot of happy birthday to my mom. Thank you very much. I am making Julia Child's uh, orange and almond cake for her with an apricot glaze. So pray for me that it comes out, guys. And Daniel, uh, Jason, Jason Daniel Stone found my Chappie Chanica funny, and he's Jewish, so he ought to know. Thank you very much for that. I, I meant that just as an oddity of, of the different spellings. It is not a, anything about uh, Judaism. Uh, uh, as an English major, I, I love words. I find words and language funny. Um, so all love with that. Let's see, I'm trying to get some more questions. Uh, I think where we're people were talking to each other during the intermission. Let's see. Doop -doop -doop -doop, and people answering each other's questions. Uh, <laughs> which movie has Woody Allen playing the cello in a marching band he keeps having to move the chair down the street in a parade 
is that bananas? Mm. It's, it's from that era, I think. It, yeah, it's probably bananas. It could be. Um, yeah, Sleeper it's was likely bananas. The first movie I rem- Sleeper was the first movie I remember seeing in the theater. That's how old I am. Let's see. Uh, let's see some questions twice. Brad's guitar garage. Brad Webb is a buddy of mine, Ted. You guys would get along swim- swimmingly. He he does what you do. And he's an Aust- he also does what I do. Um, he's 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 a very very talented guy, uh, foul mouthed, wonderful sense of humor, Australian. So it says it all. He's he's in just outside of Sydney, but uh, you you enjoy his stuff too, um, though he uh, he uh, expresses himself more fulsomely than you and I are inclined to do. Uh, but uh, he was agreeing with you on Douglas Fir sounding great. Uh, let's see some amp questions, and I, I love everybody here. And any other day, I will answer. And all any and all amp questions, but I'm trying to get to stuff just for Mr. T. Let's see. And if I miss any, I apologize. I'm trying to find them. Uh, smash that like button. I'm. I feel sorry for the poor like like button. Everyone's always telling you to do awful things to it. Um. Let's see. All right. Speaking of oil, what's your opinion on the gun oil, true oil craze that's been trending for the past few years? Um, well, I finished a neck in true oil back in 1999, so I'm not sure it's such a recent craze at this point. The stuff works fine. You know, it is a blend of oil. I think it's probably linseed oil, maybe tongue oil, and uh, natural resin varnish. And uh, it's a great way to finish a guitar if you don't have access or you don't want to ingest a whole lot of VOCs uh, through spray equipment or using spray cans. Um, It's a very friendly application process. It's hard to go wrong because it's difficult to apply too much. You won't get runs or drips. The finish that it leaves is um, not quite as hard as lacquer and it is sort of a soft sheen. Uh, It's really kind of tactile, pleasant. A lot of people like it. I will say that it tends to absorb odors over a long period of time, so it can be kind of, it has a different smell to it, an old true oiled thing. I mean, people who, you know, are finish, refinishing gun stocks will also understand that, you know, that's right next to your armpit, right? So yeah. Yeah, I find that it sort of absorbs oil in a way that a potato absorbs salt. <laughs> but yeah, no, I have no problem with it. I think it's good. I wouldn't use it on a soundboard, though. I think it absorbs too deeply into the softwood. Um and like I said, it doesn't get quite as hard as lacquer. So there might be some compromise in terms of quality of sound. But again, that is sort of a pet theory of mine and might not have anything to do with reality. I laughed because you were talking about how things absorb smell. And I I pick up a lot of vintage Fender amps from the local shop to bring back and work on. And Fender amps often are redolent of musicians' uh, uh, uh habit in tobacco and otherwise over the past 40 years and so sometimes i'll have three or four 60s fenders in the back of my car and i'm driving home and i'm like please don't let me get pulled over by a canine unit they'll never believe me yeah you have to have jefferson airplane playing lightly in the background you know right or something well with the cops in memphis i'd have to offer to share let's see (laughs) (laughs) let's see all right oh oh, i saw the question and I, i here we go from Michael Fuller. Ted, do you have anything to say about the Plex system? Hmm. They might get after me if I say what I think. No, um, Plex is a great tool. I think it's fine as long as the person who's doing the programming knows what they're doing and uh, that they're going to check the work after they're finished. I have had some experience with some guitars that were Plexed that obviously something went wrong in the programming and the crowns of the frets, perhaps they were using a pre-programmed um, uh, fret scale length or something, and the crowns weren't centered in the center of the frets. They were shifted over like half a millimeter. So you ended up with this weird asymmetric looking fret top, which, uh, you know, what are you going to do? But yeah, I have no problem with it. I think people ascribe a certain kind of magic to it that might not actually be there. It's, you know... It's as good as the person operating it. Put it that way. Oh, like I, everything had, else you know, in the world? <laughs> 60 grand hanging around and some time and maybe an apprentice or two, sure, you know, I'd, I'd order one and put it in 
my hundred square foot shop and and let someone get after it but uh, I've seen work that came out of it that was kind of mediocre and I've seen stuff that was really good so it's just like any other fret dresser you know there are people who do really accurate fret dressing and people who don't and the machine is no different Ted, how many old guilds have you run into during your practice? I'm staring down the barrel of a neck reset on a D4 in the near future. Uh, for some reason, this is not a guild area. For whatever reason, you'll find this. You know, certain pockets of the country maybe didn't have a guild dealership. And um, this place obviously didn't have one because I don't see all that many. I have performed resets on a number of them. I will say that they're renowned for not being reset friendly because they tend to have an awful lot of glue in the pocket along with the dovetail and sometimes on the face of the sides where the end of the neck contacts, which can make the necks much more difficult to pull free. So you might be there giving a bit more heat and it might take longer than it would for a Martin or a Gibson. Gibson in certain areas, certain eras had the same issue. So eh, not the easiest reset. It wouldn't be the one I would suggest for a first timer. Um, but you know, I love guilds. I think they're great. Well, thank you for that. Uh, my buddy, Brad, I was talking mentioned earlier. He has a question. I get a lot of Canadian acoustics with polyurethane peeling off the neck. It looks like they let the sanding sealer cure and applied the top coat without sanding. Was that a batch thing? Mm, depends on the manufacturer, but yeah, no, there's a definite issue that happens. Um, sanding sealer, final sanding sealer and lacquer are just barely friends when it comes to adherence. And if you get that schedule wrong by a day, like if you sprayed on the sealer on say a Friday morning and then didn't get the top coat put on that night and it sat over the weekend, unless it's heavily scuff sanded, there just isn't a kind of mechanical bond between the two of them. There isn't the sort of, sort of molecular thing that happens when you spray lacquer over top of lacquer. So yeah, that happens. There was an issue with a lot of national guitars um, in the early '90s as well. I've done, I've seen the same thing happening with those. So yeah, I don't know. It obviously there was an issue, but I don't know if it's a batch thing or just a, a methodology thing. Maybe someone didn't realize that that was going to happen. The compatibility issues. I'd be interested in knowing which Canadian acoustics they are. I bet he'll. Pop that in out. When he does, I'll, I'll add that. We'll revisit this. Jimmy Max says, This is a great idea. Love this stream. Thank you, Jimmy. What do you think about Japanese made guitars? Any favorite models or brands? I like Japanese guitars, the ones that um, with slightly larger necks. I find that uh, I've worked on a lot of Japanese made Epiphones from the early 70s when production went from Gibson directly to Japan. And those are some of the nicest I've ever played. I do a lot of works on I'll work on Yamahas as well. I've got one in the shop today, um, which, again, for a plywood top bargain basement guitar, they were remarkably consistent with the quality of craftsmanship that went into them. So, you know, in general, yes, I like Japanese guitars, um, like a. A Yamaha that's got a solid top on it is a premium quality instrument, in my opinion. And they tend to be, you know, maybe some of them have a slightly shorter scale length, which some people like. I have rather big hands, so if they've got the narrower nut width, I'm not as disposed to playing them and liking them. But, you know, I've, I've had a lot of good experiences with Japanese guitars. Okay. From Matthew Ridgeway, he's looking into hide clues, and they can be expensive. He plans on building a Petit Bush Selmer, like Django Reinhardt's. Is there a marked quality difference between eBay or Stumac hide clues? I know you're, you use fish glue primarily. I do. I also use hide glue. I use the stuff I buy, I've had for a long time. That's one of the good things about it, is if you keep it dry and in a dark place, it'll last forever, basically. Um, what you really want is technical hide glue from a violin maker, um, a violin making source. Um, I forget what the name of it, DYK in Germany, for one. They have really, really clear glue. They're refined to the point where they're almost like glass when they dry. Uh, but in general, like 
high glue is available in a number of different, they call them gram strengths, which is technical measurement for them. Um, you want one that's between 192 gram to 251. Those are commonly available. And those are the ones that give you enough open time to get parts together. The higher gram strength glues could be 500, 700. Those are designed for use in machinery um, assemblies where things are kept constantly hot and they're not friendly to work with if you're you know, a, a hand builder trying to put things together and get clamps on, basically. But if you buy high glue from any of the woodworking suppliers, um, Garrett Wade or Lee Valley, or, you know, depends where you go, or Stumac, they'll be just fine. You know, there's no issue with them. You could even use Jello. You could use unflavored gelatin and um, you'll get a good bond. That's the interesting That's... thing about high glue. It's all come... <clears throat> that's a that's a jello. money answer there. Basically. So everyone who liked that answer and that kind of knowledge and just rattled it off, he's got it. If you haven't, go to Ted's channel and subscribe and like the hell out of everything you see because it's, it's just fantastic. He'll he'll drop that in the middle of a twenty minute video, and you got to be paying attention. So I mean, you get so if you, if you wanted to learn how to do what he does, if you sat down and watched every video he'd ever did for a month and then rewatched it twice. You'd be much better prepared than having just sat down with a guitar and some tools and a book in front of you because you would have seen these kinds of things and oh in this situation i'm not going to do that or, or this is the secret and it's, i mean right he just gave you would save you three hours of googling um uh let's see here next question uh from robot songs he picked up an old harmony om style for cheap to better his acoustic repair skills. If he wants to open her up, is removing the top or back more problematic? Secondary issues that might arise. Generally speaking, the back is the one that you'd want to take off because you're not having to deal with the fretboard extension unless you've somehow already removed the neck. But usually the back is what comes off. It can be more difficult to work on bracing problems because you've got to come up with some creative clamping solutions with the back off. But... Um, Generally speaking, it's it's easier to put it back together. Uh, it's a funny thing with those old harmonies. At this point, they're rising in price to the point where they're not so easy to suggest people work on them anymore. It used to be the thing, like, you know, if you wanted to learn this trade, you buy an old harmony and get to work on it. But some of these are now like 1100 1200 bucks, and people start to feel a little bit eh, reticent about, you know, chopping into them. But it is the way to go. If you can get one of these old ones, they're usually put together with hide glue, um, great big globs of high glue all over the place. Um, talking about quality of high glue, they, the Harmony factory must have had a glue pot that no, never, ever got cleaned. Because if you look at the inside of a Harmony, you'll see running driblets of glue that look like blood. They're dark brownish red and, um, you know, really dirty glue of, frankly, inferior quality. But they, they function just fine. Um, yeah, no, take the back off. It might be helpful to come up with some kind of form if you've traced the back so that you can hold it in the right <coughs> conditions when you put the back back on. Uh, sometimes these things spring open after the back is removed because there's you know, latent tension in the wood that all of a sudden gets to be free. So it can be difficult to clamp them back in place. But um, yeah, it's not usually too big of an issue. And, and taking the, bar the backs apart is not so difficult either if you can get a, a knife blade in between the seam they sort of crack open with the sound of like popcorn it's kind of a crackly sensation as the glue gives way but um yeah it'll scare it's, me to death you'll, it'll scare <laughs> you to death but it's actually easier and less traumatic than doing something that's been put together with um a yellow woodworker's glue because uh they they come apart more easily and when they do fracture apart they can they they produce little sort of keyway pieces and the, the parts that kind of fit back together in one configuration. So they kind of hold themselves in the right spot when it comes time to glue them back. So yeah, do a harmony. And now for something completely different. <clears throat> actually, it's actually a very good question that I've run into. As a right-handed player, do you find it odd to work on left-handed guitars? I know I hate it when I get in a left-handed amp. Yeah, left-handed amps are the worst. But uh, I, I have a couple of customers who are collectors of older guitars and they're always asking me to change them over from right-handed to left-handed. So I have, it's something that happens almost monthly for me. And 
I have no real problem with it, except when it comes time to making a new nut or routing a saddle slot, because they're reversed. And if you're not in the right mindset, you'll go ahead and do what muscle memory tells you to do. And you're going to end up with, you know, the big strings on the wrong side. So beyond, you know, just kind of checking with myself before doing that, there's, I find no issue. Testing them out is kind of fun because you have to kind of think backwards if you're going to do some chords. Exactly. Yeah, no, it's funny. I find that playing a left-handed instrument with my right hand, um, for about 10 minutes afterwards, I get this strange kind of swimmy feeling like I, your brain, your neural pathways do something funny mm -hmm. and you can observe yourself responding to, you know, forcing them into a pattern of thinking that they don't normally deal with. It's kind of an interesting experience. I would suggest to people who've never tried it, try playing a left-handed guitar upside down and backwards and, and experience it. I have, and, and I, I, I suck even more. Uh, you know, <laughs> Chris Nix, who was my guest on Technical Difficulties last month, he's been over to my house, and I've got all right-handed guitars, and he'll pick up one of these strats upside down backwards and just burn. Just His brain is just wired a different way than, our, than the rest of ours. Uh, but yeah, it, it is interesting. Just you feel... I mean, there's muscle memory, which is one thing that we're, we're bereft of in that situation. But as as Ted says, it's just like, hey, that that neuron's never been used before. What what's up with that? It's you know, it's like you could work out all day long lifting weights, and then you play piano and you get one little muscle that you've never used before. You know, the, the rest of you could be the Hulk, but that one little muscle have never done it before. You play piano, and oh my God, it hurts. Weird weird things in our brains and our, and our bodies. At least that's what I blame my, my uh, lack of ability on. It's just it's just weird things beyond my control. Uh, let's see, uh, Max Power. I'm, I'm intentionally skipping your very nice question about Ted getting nervous or shaky on, on priceless instruments because he kind of addressed that at the very beginning. Um, thank you very much, Colby Jack. That's very kind of you. Thoughts on Collings and Taylor? I have not worked on very many Collings guitars, and I don't know whether that is just the quality that goes into the workmanship in producing them, or whether it's just their rarity, especially in my area. I see a lot of Taylors. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Bob Taylor as a businessman, and you know he's come up with ways of building guitars to an exacting standard that it's hard to overemphasize the importance of Bob Taylor within that industry. Um, personally, I don't find the characteristic Taylor sound all that fulfilling to my ears. I don't find them all that fun to play. And I don't, I have a hard time describing why, but it has something to do with either the neck geometry or the shape of the neck. And I find that they are lacking certain frequencies that, you know, give me that little happy feeling. So, you know, I, I concur. I concur completely, and I, I also applaud your diplomacy. <laughs> well, they're diehard Taylor fans, and mm -hmm. they're right. You know, they love their guitars, and they should because they got something that works for them. Uh, it wouldn't work for me. That's and that's okay. I bought I mm -hmm. bought one hoping to find that elusive spark, and it, I never bonded with it. And it, it I have a um, to fill the same role that that. Uh, Taylor OM was going to do. I have a um, East, Eastman, which I find mm -hmm. infinitely uh, more musical for me. Uh, but also, as you were saying, CNC stuff now with the the budget stuff, eleven hundred dollar Eastman. But that thing compares to multi thousand dollar Martins I've played. I love that that company's uh, acoustics at least. Robot Songs has a question. Uh, here, uh, suggestions for fabrics for French polishing. Old t-shirts and rags leave behind fibers. Yeah, what you want is an outside wrapper made with um, linen. A linen sheet would be perfect, well laundered. You know, something that has been through the wash a hundred times. The inner material can be, well, traditionally it was wool. Um, cotton works fine for the inner stuff. Um, I have used old cotton shirts for the, the stuff that holds on to the shellac but the outside should be linen um like i say you know, linen dress shirt if you can find one of those 
or you can simply go to a fabric store and ask for some, you know, buy a yard of white linen. But I will admit that sometimes I use the old t-shirt too, because it's at hand. <laughs> <laughs> JDS asks, is Stu Mac your main tools material supplier, or do you have a good source in Canada to suggest? It's difficult to suggest. Uh, it's hard to find places that are as all encompassing where you'll find so many things that you will find at Stu Mac. I have a difficulty with their shipping system because they use FedEx as a customs broker. And if I'm not careful and I, I have the Stu Mac Max um, uh, account, but if I get something in like the one week shipping, they'll tack on 30, 40% in customs brokerage fees, which it just kills the, the bottom line. Um, but beyond that, no, I use Stu Mac. In Canada, there's a place called Solo Guitars, just outside of Toronto, which is making waves. They're, you know, developing a bigger inventory. Um, Next Gen uh, is an electronic supplier that carries uh, AMP and electronic supplies. They're a Canadian supplier. But it's sort of hit and miss, you know. You've got a, a lot of little suppliers uh, none of which are going to give you everything in one place. It, it's in many cases, it's easier to buy from Stu Mac because you you've got one order coming, rather than six or seven little boxes you've got to look out for and hope don't get stolen off the front porch. <laughs> yeah, I can relate. Uh, Mauser is is my Stu Mac, but yeah, same same concept. Um, Ilmiris Chimatulinus uh, Chimatulinus. Ch uh, I believe the second part of your of your qu the second question it was addressed earlier. He, he glues in, but Ted, do you have a stance on stainless steel versus nickel frets or a preference, or is it just whatever the client wants? It's what the client wants. Um, there are people that I know I've done work for who just burn through nickel frets at such a rate that it makes complete sense to always use stainless. Um, in terms of the tonal changes, I find there is a subtle difference, but that could just be, again, be my psychoacoustic idea that, you know, I'm working with a harder material, therefore it's probably going to sound slightly different. But um, in terms of workability, I've found ways of, of dealing with stainless. Uh, I don't charge more for a stainless job than I do for um, a nickel, other than the cost of the fret material itself, which tends to be about 50% more expensive. Um, yeah, no, I have no problem working with stainless. Um, on the whole, it's more pleasurable working with the uh, the nickel silver frets because they just you know you're not sitting there filing them for as long and uh, yeah so sort of six of one half a dozen of the other but they are definitely longer lasting. Derek Stiller asks any thoughts on graphite slash rosin body acoustics sound quality value. Um, it's sad. It's sort of sad to see Rain Song just uh, went under a couple months ago. Who were sort of a pioneers of the carbon fiber body system. I've worked on some from Emerald, which were quite lovely. Uh, again, these are sort of kind of qualitative judgments that different people will hear different things. Um, I've never been really attracted to them. I'm not a fan of ovations. I think there are a lot of guitar repair people who don't like ovations for a number of reasons. Because they're not they're, they're not but, canoeing. If they're if they're canoeing, then That's, they have a need. Yeah, I mean, I find here in Canada, with the humidity issue again in the winter, um, having that supple, solid top attached to a rigid fiberglass frame <laughs> um, or carbon fiber frame, it's just it's unyielding and it just doesn't bend with the top, so they all crack and they crack in really horrible ways um, because of the bracing system. So. At this point, you know, I sort of steer away from trying to work on those. And so, you know, they're kind of, in our climate anyway, they're almost like a disposable instrument, which doesn't sit well with me. But like that I said, said I'd still like a breadwinner. I kind of like. I still want a breadwinner. Yeah. Well, yeah. No. Yeah, the breadwinner, of course. I mean, the all the seventies ovations are wild. I mean, yeah, I want that authentic cool. Danny Partridge experience. Uh, yes. A similar question, and then a follow up. Uh, from Brad, which applies to this. In experience with Garrison Acoustics with composite bracing, and then Brad says Garrison was the brand with a lot of peeling neck lacquer. He peeled the top coat and sanded the, the sanding sealer and recoated with poly, and it looked perfect afterward. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Garrison was an interesting little thing that happened in the east coast of Canada where it was a carbon fiber 
slash resin based bracing system, almost like a skeleton upon which a laminated sides and back were affixed. I think some of them are solid and solid tops glued to this substructure, which produced not only the bracing, but the binding as well. It was like a hollow guitar shaped box on which the, the wood was glued. Um, they only lasted a few years and they sort of, they went out of business in a very strange way, which left a lot of people with a bad taste in their mouth because for a whole lot of guitar repair people and, and builders in Canada sort of moved to work in this brand new guitar factory, which I think had backing from Gibson at that point. And they were only there for about two or three years and everyone had to go back home when they sold out. Um, and it was, you know, kind of killed off by a, a, a corporate kind of takeover sort of situation. But yeah, no, Lovely. the instruments, I've worked on a couple of them. They're okay. You know, I, again, did not really do very much for me in terms of happiness when playing them. Um, it was an interesting idea, technologically very forward thinking, but, um, yeah. Well, Ted, again, I want to apologize if I feel like I'm just like throwing stuff at you, but I, I'm aware of your time constraints. I'm trying to maximize oh, it's okay. the time we, we got with you. Uh, I could do this with you for, for a whole afternoon, but I think we need more, even more coffee. Kevin Sibbert says, great episode. What a treat for viewers. Thank you, Kevin. I think I can say that from both of us. Reattachment of the original pickguard on a 67 Gibson B25. Unrelated, but the bridge is rosewood, not plastic. He promises. <laughs> yeah, the plastic bridges. Uh, the bombers, the B-25s. Um, originally, of course, that would have been put on with an uh, uh, acetone-based solvent. The same thing that they used for binding, which basically glued the plastic. They melted onto the surface of the, the guitar. Um, there can be quite a lot of tension when those are released, and sometimes the pick guards will start to shrink immediately once it's come off the instrument. So oftentimes they won't go back in exactly the same location because the actual dimensions of the pick guard has changed. To glue those back on, I usually use tight bond, which seems strange, but for whatever reason, it seems to get a pretty good hold on the backside of the pick guard. If you lightly sand it with say 220 grit scratches, there's a kind of mechanical thing that happens. I'm not alone in this. Um, Mark Stutman uses tight bond for that as well. I think Steve Connell, uh, so a lot of us are doing that using aliphatic based woodworking glue to put back on the, uh, the pick guards with the assumption that if anything ever happens in the future where it has to come off again, it's the easiest way to deal with it. Uh, cause you could heat it up and, and it just it behaves properly. Now, are you making a distinction between tight bond and tight bond two? I would only use tight bond original tight bond two okay. is a water resistant glue. Tight Bond 3, definitely not, because Tight Bond 3 is designed for use in situations where it could actually be immersed in boiling water and it won't release, which for a repair guy is just a no-go. You don't want to do that. So Tight Bond Original is the way okay. only. Uh, the reason I ask is because I, I use Tight Bond 2 to reapply Tolex because it has a very short working time for what I need, but it's long enough that I can stretch the Tolex out and it'll... Uh, then, then I expose it to air, wait two minutes, then put it back and stretch it again. At that point, it bonds real well, then tape to hold it in place. But I know that Type Bond 3 is not your friend for that. Uh, <laughs> ask me how I learned that one. Uh, yeah, so these are the things you, know, type, you hear. Uh, oh, it's Type Bond, he said. And then you get the Type Bond 3 and then uh, Nightmare. Yeah, again, Sorry. the working knowledge, you know, it comes into play. I, I can say these things with the expectation that someone has, uh, has had an experience with one of the other Type Bonds. Type Bond 2 also dries very orange in color versus the original in a way that is almost like Cheese Whiz versus something that kind of matches with the guitar. Well, between the wood, the pine of a, of a fender, old Fender cabinet and the Tolex, not a problem. I wouldn't, uh, I would go with Ted's suggestion for beneath the pick guard on a Gibson. <laughs> yeah, to go with the one that you can't see would probably be big be better yeah right i need those uh, uh what was what was the office space the office space form uh cover letters uh, oh tps reports yeah i really need those tps reports have, have you have you have, did you get the memo uh the sorry memo. yeah <laughs> of course you know that i think i think uh if we were to get together in real life we'd probably just uh watch movies and, and talk about filmmaking because uh, the, the guitars are just day job stuff. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, if all right, here's one. If fret is low or notched, when do you repair with solder versus swapping for a new fret wire? Hmm, that's a technique I'm not aware of. Uh, I would say never using solder. I don't think you'd get a good enough bond between the yeah. nickel and the lead. Um, we hopefully, I know, I know an awful lot about solder, solder. And, and I, w I know an awful lot about the solder side of that equation. And I would not recommend that. Um, yeah, no. This is n not going to be to Ted's level, but w when I've had a guitar that had like one little nick in a, in a fret, like if something fell against it and you know, like, oh, on the G string on the third fret, there's one little bitty slight divot. I've actually gotten the back of a stainless steel spoon and it just kind of pushes back and forth and mends it well enough that it becomes not a problem to the playing, even if it's not as good as a full recrown and because that can involve changing the level in that area. Um, mm -hmm. Stainless steel spoon, by the way, makes the difference. It has to be harder than the fret wire. Um, I should I should shut up and sit on my hands when it comes to this stuff with Ted here, but uh, usually, usually people love these these little tidbits for me, and now I'm like, I'm such a fraud. Uh, let's see here. Everyone has information to add to this conversation, you know? I think um, everyone does something differently. Then, Yeah, I mean, you can burnish nickel silver frets in weird ways. You can actually push that metal around. So, mm -hmm. But it also has a, a working hardness. You can out, almost like anneal it at times or cause work hardening. Like if you use a radius bender on stainless on um, nickel silver frets and push it through and straighten it out a number of times you can actually increase the i'm not sure if it's really the rockwell hardness we're talking about but it ends up being kind of work hardened to the point where it will be more akin to a stainless than an unworked um nickel silver fret which is a tip i, I learned from dan Erlwine. there you go uh, Matthew Ridgway again asks, in your own instruments, Ted, is there a gem you have in your possession, a go-to guitar, and how many are in your collection? I don't collect guitars, and the ones that I have are the ones that didn't sell, so there are no <laughs> gems. Um, they're usually something that people aesthetically didn't connect with. Uh, I have a couple of classical guitars I built. I have um, I've got a couple of acoustics, but yeah, I've got one electric I sort of assembled for myself. But I don't, again, I don't collect them very much because there's a constant stream of guitars coming through, which I see. And, um, you know, I get enough joy from just sort of playing to make sure that things are in tune or listening for the weird buzz that no one else can hear except for the customer that um, I don't feel a need to. Also space. Storage is a real issue, which is something that people don't recognize. If you're, if you're doing this kind of work, you have to find a place to put a whole number of guitars that you have to work on and store. I'm so, so feeling you right now. <laughs> yeah, I've got amps everywhere. I don't, people are always amazed when I say, I don't actually own an amplifier of my own right now. I, mm. I've, I've keep planning to make one and I just, I'm always too busy and I always have something here to play. So Gal Alaya Levi or Le Levi says, I experienced change in string height during the life of coated strings. In the first three weeks, I have great action and then becomes uh, tall on the 12th, even though the strings are quite fresh. Advice? Hmm. That is a new one to me. Uh, I cannot think of an instance where I've seen that myself, and I don't know why it would happen. Um, I'm wondering if, yeah, if, no. if, if it's a causation correlation confusion that maybe, maybe, maybe uh, your neck is just changing. Uh, is it, the relief is changing due to changes in temperature, humidity, and it's maybe that neck isn't as stable as you need it to be. I, I, I would have to have yeah. that guitar in front of me to take measurements myself. Exactly. Yeah, you want to make sure that you know there is enough tension on the truss rod to keep it in a certain location. You also have to understand that guitars do move more than some people really give them credit for, acoustic guitars especially. Like there's a reason that most acoustic guitars aren't set up with the action heights that we find in electrics because seasonal changes means that, you know, every four months, you know, half a 64th, um, 15 thousandths of an inch can sometimes, you know, up and down as the top moves, uh, as it contracts or expands with the amount of moisture that's in it. So... Yeah, I would probably lean with you on, on that and suggest that it's probably not the string specifically. 
Christopher Butler says, Ted, I put GraphTech string saver saddles on most of my electrics since the 90s and never break strings. Uh, side note, I never break strings at the saddles on any of my guitars, and they're you know, not GraphTechs in sight. They're just deburred. Uh, but any downsides besides appearance? No, obviously not. I mean, if they've been working for 20 or 30 years now, um, no, if you can deal with the appearance, then that's fine. Uh, like I don't bring, str I don't break strings as a rule either. And if I do, they tend to be at the headstock end, you know, for some reason, my G strings always end up snapping, but that's more just, you know, the function of the G string. But at the tuner the, uh, or at the, at the nut? Yeah. At the tuner, rarely yeah. at the nut. Yeah, I, occasionally I'll find a, a little burr right where where the hole in a tuner peg is. Sometimes mm -hmm. if, if if the string is passing over that hole and it goes in a straight line right at that hole and then goes round again, at either of those two bearing edges it can break. And sh short of chamfering that opening in the tuner, by the time the string does that, it's usually that string needed to be changed anyway because of all the little indentations on the bottom of the string where that's contact with the frets. Uh, but... Uh, uh, in another stream, Christopher, I'll show you how I did this, adjusted the, 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 the Callaham saddles on my Strat, where I, uh, I, I use a Dremel to, op to lengthen the opening in the middle so that the strings lost a witness point. Because most of the time on a Strat, it's that extra witness point. If here's the saddle and here's it goes up, right where the string hits there, it goes, so it comes out of the saddle, hits there, and then goes to the body and then goes down. Removing the metals to remove that witness point makes strings not break sorry again I'm, I'm talking about guitar stuff in, in front of no. someone who I would mention exactly the I. same thing no no I mean I Rene Martinez who was um, Stevie Ray Vaughan's tech did mm -hmm. that an awful lot on his guitars because he was an inveterate string breaker right so mm -hmm. it's funny how much we ask of a guitar string to bend it over those points um, these points of contact you really do have to sort of dress them off and make them as friendly or rounded for the string path as you can get them um, Again, some people, for whatever reason, just don't break strings, and other people do. And uh, it can be hard to change that, even if you do all of the right things, like relieve the back end of the nut so there's no binding there, or, you know, dress the, the contact points in the saddle or behind the saddle. You know, it just, mm -hmm. some people are just string breakers. You can't change them. Well, that's why, that's why you take away the big old heavy pick and give them... <laughs> It's amazing how many you know, uh, guys I, I, who, who want a fat lead sound are using a Fender Extra Light pick. I'm like, well, I could charge you a lot to mod the amp, or here's a 25 cent piece of plastic. Try that first. Uh, I've lost a lot of money uh, not making custom EQs for pedal for people instead of saying, try try this uh, uh, 1.5 millimeter. Um, Robot songs. Ted, I imported a large cellulose acetate sheet from abroad that cost a pretty penny. This summer, I guess it got too hot in the shop and it warped. Recommendations to re relax it back flat or is this shot? There is, depending on the thickness, in a cellulose, in a cellulose uh, pickguard sheet, a lot of trapped, volatile, uh, basically they melt the plastic using a thinner which is acetone or something similar, a butyl cellulosol. And that stuff remains in there for a very long time. Um, yeah, no, uh, you can clamp it flat with, I never want to suggest using heat to somebody when they're dealing with cellulose because it's so incredibly flammable. But there are people who will at times gently heat blocks of say aluminum or something and clamp them flat and get good results. But, um, to my mind, once they turn into potato chips, they always want to go back that way. They seem to have a certain kind of memory to them. So, eh, I would feel really... Mm, I, there's a certain amount of trepidation about using that on someone else's guitar because, you know, you might be setting them up for more issues down the road. So I'd probably, try, you know, kind of... Celluloid is a, is a real tough thing because you, have, you pay a premium to ship it anywhere because it is a hazardous material. Uh, these days, I use acetate um, pick guards more often. Um, the thicker ones that Stumac sells are really kind of nice because they're very stable over time. And I can thin them down by thickness sanding them to get something that's more like a vintage pick guard thickness. So 
Yeah. The other thing is you're often ordering these from locales where you don't know what's gone into the, the pick guard, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are certain manufacturers who are selling the stuff on eBay and they could just be, it, the, the quality isn't that great. And let's say that they might end up like those those Gretsch pick guards or um, or binding strips more frequently than you know, the stuff that uh, Gibson or Martin was using. Well, so, Ted, we have reached your contractually obligated two hours. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it, it flies by when you do this. Um, I would love to have you back on any time, but I understand that you are a busy man and I've got to go do a bunch of family stuff. Let me... Uh, ask you to indulge us for one last question, which I think is a good one to end on because it's kind of a fun one without a lot of pressure. It's from Max Power. You're stranded on an island and you have a choice of one of the instruments you have played, repaired, or owned. What guitar would it be, electric or acoustic? Ooh. 1958 Gibson um, L1, strangely. Bottom of the brand sort of the cheaper one with uh, ladder bracing, but it had a magic to it. And it's one of those things where you can't justify it by any means. It just, it is what it is. And it, it touched my soul. And uh, I found myself playing that one at odd moments and getting a little bit almost jealous that the customer was going to take it away. But um, yeah, no, it, for me, it's more about the music than it is about the instrument, strangely enough. Mm -hmm. So as long as I had a guitar that would play well, I'd be happy. So, you know, I'll make music on anything. If you give me a guitar, I'll play it. Well, Ted, I want to thank you very much. It's been very nice getting to meet you and to know you a little bit better. Uh, you are welcome back mm -hmm. anytime. I know your schedule is crazy, uh, but anytime you'd like to come back here and just talk it out, we're here for you, man. We're here for you. So everyone by, <laughs> say goodbye, goodbye to Mr. Ted. And uh, remember, go to his channel, T. Woodford. And he gets so in-depth, and it's entertaining at the same time. And I, I enjoy them very much. And I tremendously thank you for being here. I really appreciate the opportunity. This has been great on this end, uh, meeting you as well. You know, you're more than just the voice behind the camera. And uh, I hope that you try the, um, um, I don't know, when you're doing that cake, you've got to do some voices of your own. If I'm, you know, I, I don't know. I don't think you're ready for my Julia Child, so I don't think I can yeah, get that Julia Child, that octave. You know, it, it, it's a difficult one to pull off. Yes. Anyway, uh, I, thank I'm you so much I'm not going to practice again. it thank here, that's for, for sure. No? Okay. But no, I appreciate it so much. Thank and, you, everyone, as everyone, for everyone say, your time and watching and stuff. Auf Wiedersehen, everybody. Have a good day and a good night. Oh, that was so much fun. All right, let's see. I got a thing from last week there. Sorry about that. All right, uh, yeah. Everybody go to Chet Ted's channel. Subscribe. Like the hell out of everything. I hope everyone has a great day. I've got to go make an apricot glaze, and I've got to get the Christmas tree down from the attic and all the boxes of holiday spirit and maybe find some of my own. Everybody be well. Everyone be safe. And I don't know if we're going to do another one of the, these this uh, this month because um, next weekend I've got a family thing with my wife's family. Then the next week is Christmas. Well, depending on the schedule, we may, we may do a little Boxing Day thing for those who want to get uh, escape from their own family for an hour or two and talk about amps and other important stuff. But if not, I will talk to you guys next year. <laughs>